Hi everyone. So as a mom of four who is currently 35 weeks pregnant with my fifth baby, I have been receiving several questions to talk about what I eat, especially as it pertains to the fact that I have pretty long hair now. My hair is at tailbone length and I guess a lot of people think that having a lot of babies means that your hair might not be healthy so people are just interested in hearing about what I eat. So I don't claim to be perfect in any way about what I eat but I do put a lot of time and priority into the way I'm eating, especially now that I'm pregnant and my body really is needing the extra nourishment. So in this video, it's just going to be a casual kind of sit down conversation with you guys about what I'm eating right now. I'll also talk to you about the supplements I'm taking and shocker, the fact that I do not take prenatal vitamins. I have not taken prenatal vitamins for any of my pregnancies except for the first. So we're going to talk about all of that in this video. So let's jump into it. So we all know that the health of our hair is affected by the way that we eat, right? Or if you never heard that before, now it's the first time. But we all, of course, have very different definitions of what constitutes a healthy diet. There are all manner of sort of diet factions around who say you should eat this way or you should eat that way or you should cut out this food group or cut out that food group. So this is this video is obviously simply going to be my interpretation of what a healthy diet looks like for me right now at this stage in my life and I'm not trying to tell anyone else to eat in this way. This is just what's working for me at the moment. Anyway, so big pieces of dietary or nutritional inspiration for me has been the work of Weston A. Price, who I will talk about a little later in the video. He has an awesome book, I, don't, I believe it was written in the 30s, called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration and he did a ton of research into that book and it's really amazing. I'll talk about that later in the video. I also read a book which is a more modern book that works on a lot of Weston A. Price's findings. It's called Nourishing Traditions. I believe the author's name is Sally Fallon. That was the book that first sort of opened my eyes to a lot of the ways that I think about food and what are healthy foods for me to be eating, especially as a pregnant or breastfeeding mother. So rest assured that I am very far from being a perfect example of following any sort of dietary direction or dietary recommendations. I'm a real person, I'm very busy, and I do my best, and I am prioritizing eating healthy, especially right now because my body needs it, but I'm not perfect. I eat out fairly often, I am busy, I don't do a perfect job, so please don't think that I am claiming to be perfect in this area and get all stressed out thinking you have to be the same way because no one is perfect in the way that they eat and frankly I just want to have a balanced approach to the way that I eat. I don't want to be very strict and follow a bunch of rules and do's and don'ts about what I eat because I don't think that's a healthy way to face food and I just don't think it's a healthy mindset to carry through life so that's my take. So more recently, like actually during this pregnancy, I have been feeling super inspired by what's called the pro-metabolic approach to eating. It's not a diet, or at least it shouldn't be viewed as a diet. It's more like a way of viewing food and nourishing ourselves that prioritizes having a healthy metabolism because our metabolism does so much in our bodies. It does so much more than just regulating how fast how quickly we burn calories. It really is vitally important for our health. And so the pro-metabolic approach to eating is all about eating frequently and making sure we're getting enough calories and that those calories are coming from nutrient-dense food sources so that we're giving our body the fuel it needs to be able to run optimally and not always be in a state of stress. I'm not gonna lie, my last baby's birth, my fourth baby, that, that was all great. The pregnancy was great, the birth was great, and the postpartum was relatively good, but my recovery in that postpartum was not at all what I would have liked it to be, and I actually chalk this up to the fact that I was not eating enough during that pregnancy and during that postpartum. I was actually on sort of an intermittent fasting kick at that time, and I don't think it was healthy for me to be doing it, especially in the way that I was doing it. And so that's where I'm coming from now, going into this pregnancy. I have a huge priority on nourishing myself and making sure that I'm getting enough calories and enough nutrients. Also, <laughs> I don't know why, but my voice has been somewhat raspy lately, so I apologize for that. I have no idea why I'm not sick. 
maybe it's just a side effect of pregnancy. I hope it goes away after the baby's born because I do not like having a raspy voice. Okay, so when I say nutrient-dense food, what exactly do I mean by that? I never even heard the phrase nutrient-dense food until I believe reading Sally Fallon's book, Nourishing Traditions. And basically what I mean by that is foods that contain high amounts of vitamins and nutrients that are sort of like the basic building blocks of what our bodies need to be healthy. So things like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, etc, etc. Many of these vitamins are actually fat soluble vitamins, so that's why later in the video you're going to see that I actually do place a high emphasis on getting healthy saturated fats in my diet on a regular basis, especially during pregnancy and postpartum. Also, nutrient-dense food is anything that's high in a lot of B vitamins or a lot of iron. And also, when I say nutrient-dense foods, I'm talking about foods that not only contain these vitamins and nutrients, but they contain them in a form that is readily accessible for our bodies to be able to assimilate and break down. So often, these are actually animal products because animal products are, they do contain a lot of nutrients that are more recognizable to our bodies and easier to break down, not necessarily than plant products, but often that is the case. Okay, so let's talk about the fact that I am 35 weeks pregnant and just talk about how that side of things affects the way I eat because it definitely does. Being pregnant is definitely a very good motivator to eat healthier. If not for the health of your baby, then certainly because I at least have a lot of negative symptoms and I notice very quickly if I have not been eating sufficiently or eating the right kinds of foods. So I aim in my pregnancies to follow a loose version of what's called the Brewer Pregnancy Diet. Now I don't like the word diet and I don't really use this as a diet. I don't follow any sort of checklist or anything like that. What is the Brewer Pregnancy Diet? So it was developed by Dr. Tom Brewer in I believe the 1950s and 60s as a means of treating through nutrition women who had preeclampsia and hypertension and also as a means of preventing these conditions from occurring in the first place. So this diet places a high emphasis not only on getting enough calories, although that's a big part of it, but on getting a lot of protein into pregnant mothers as well as sufficient amounts of salt because protein and salt especially are very important for the blood volume expansion that happens during pregnancy. If you weren't aware, during pregnancy I believe a woman woman's blood volume doubles. It might even be more than that. I think it at least doubles anyways. And as you can imagine, that can put a lot of stress on the body or just it puts a lot of demands on the body if we're not taking in the amount of, of food, of protein, of salt, of nourishment that we need to be able to support our blood to expand. And when we're not taking in enough of these things and we're pregnant, our blood volume is trying to expand and so this can put a lot of stress on the body and lead to more serious pregnancy complications. So our modern western culture today tends to place a big emphasis on pregnant women not gaining too much weight and so usually they mean you shouldn't gain over I believe 35 pounds maybe more if you're severely underweight to begin with. And I've heard the traditional, not traditional, but the conventional Western allopathic uh, saying about how much you should eat. They basically just say you only need an extra like 200 calories a day or something when you're pregnant, which basically amounts to like an extra piece of toast. And I definitely don't agree with that. It's certainly not the case for me. I need a ton of extra calories when I'm pregnant and I have noticed a big difference in this pregnancy and how I'm feeling in my body. Even compared to how I was feeling in my body before getting pregnant with this baby, I was feeling pretty bad in some ways on some days and honestly I think it was because I was not eating enough and not prioritizing eating enough. And now that I'm pregnant and I am prioritizing that, taking in a lot of extra calories, I'm feeling pretty good in my body so that's a really wonderful thing for me. So again, like I said before, I don't follow an actual diet checklist for the Brewer Pregnancy Diet, but I have looked at the checklists many times to remind me to have a rough idea mostly of the amount of protein that I want to be taking in per day for my body weight. And so 
I've just kind of set up my days and my meals and my snacks so that I'm pretty sure that on most days I'm getting enough protein. And I also just eat whenever I'm hungry. I'm usually eating now several times throughout the day because I get hungry a lot. And when I do eat, I try to get some sort of protein in every time I eat. If not protein, then certainly a high quality fat source. So a lot of calories to keep me going. Okay, so let's talk about the way that my diet actually looks on a practical day-to-day -day level. This is just going to be mostly a conversation. It's not going to be an actual day in the life showing you the meals I make. Um, I probably will do a video like that at some point, but right now it, that I, <laughs> the thought of that kind of stresses me out. So it's just going to be a casual conversation video today. Let's jump into it. So like I said, I eat whenever I'm hungry these days. I try to eat as soon as I start noticing I'm hungry, even sometimes eating before I start feeling hungry because in this pregnancy I've noticed my hunger pangs start kicking in extremely fast. I can think that I'm full and then five minutes later I'm like starving. I take that as a cue that my body is just needing a lot of regular eating throughout the day whether or not I necessarily feel hungry. Frankly, eating has been feeling like a full-time job these days compared to how I was before. So it's kind of a good shift for me, actually. This pregnancy has been sort of a gift to focus more on prioritizing myself and nourishing myself rather than always getting caught up in, you know, the busyness of life as a mom, YouTuber, or whatever. So eggs actually make up a massive part of my diet at the moment. I love eggs all the time. I grew up eating eggs every day for breakfast. We had chickens, so I've always loved eggs, but especially when I'm pregnant, I use eggs as a way to start off my day on the right foot to make sure I'm getting a lot of protein right off the bat. So for breakfast, I literally have three to four eggs every day for breakfast. And then often I'll actually have eggs again during the day if I'm hungry, for example. If I'm needing protein and there's no protein handy, like if there's no cooked meat already in the fridge, I'll just make myself some eggs because they're quick and easy. Or I often make eggs for my whole family for dinner because again, they're quick and easy, but they're also very nutritious. From the book Nourishing Traditions that I read several years ago, I learned that egg yolks especially are very nutrient dense. They have a lot of very important vitamins and minerals and just things in them that we need, especially when we're pregnant, especially to grow in a developing baby. And obviously I'm also eating a lot of meat. It's very funny actually how noticeably larger our grocery bill becomes when I'm pregnant versus when I'm not pregnant because I'm just making sure we're getting like lots more meat. So we have meat for every day, for certainly for every dinner. There's some sort of main meat component in our house. This isn't often anything very complicated. I've been pretty busy lately and also not having a lot of energy, so my husband's been barbecuing a lot lately, so we get some... I'm sorry, I'm very out of breath. <laughs> So we buy um, hamburger patties that are made only with ground beef and they're made with ground beef that is free from antibiotics and steroids during the raising of the cows. And I also have been loving Italian pork sausages lately. So that's kind of like a go-to meal for if I've forgotten to defrost anything or if I'm having a busy day, my husband will barbecue and he doesn't mind because that's probably one of his favorite meals anyway. <laughs> So when I am actually cooking a proper meal for dinner and it's not eggs or it's not barbecue, um, I've been making a lot of roast chicken lately. I love making roast chicken because it's quick and easy. I cook it in my instant pot. It's delicious. And then I have bones left over. So I save, I always save bones from a roast chicken or from any meat that we eat that has bones. I keep them in a Ziploc bag in the freezer and I use them to make a bone broth. And I'll be talking about bone broth a little more in a moment. I've also been loving to make meat pie, French Canadian meat pie made with ground beef and ground pork and mashed potatoes and it's like the ultimate delicious comfort food for me right now. I kind of change up what I'm making but basically when I'm pregnant it's always a very protein rich meal. And I do prefer to get my protein from animal sources, especially when I'm pregnant because it's more accessible to my body and it's easier to digest than beans and legumes. But I do like beans and legumes occasionally as well. And I do aim to have veggies with every meal as well. It doesn't always necessarily happen if I'm in a rush, but at the very least I aim to give me and my boys a side serving of raw fermented sauerkraut because it's just a great digestive aid and has a lot of probiotics and enzymes in it. Frankly, now that it's winter, I actually don't have a huge emphasis on having a ton of 
vegetables and fruit, certainly not fresh vegetables and fruit, because I like to sort of eat with the seasons, and I think that's something that we tend to forget in our modern culture with the amazing grocery stores that we have and the the ability to ship food from all over different parts of the world so that we're always having access to things that would have otherwise been off limits during the winter. But I do actually like to eat things that are more in season. I just think it's easier on the body to not be eating foods that are sort of more designed to be eaten in summer, things that are cooling or things that are raw. I like to eat more cooked food and just rich, rich sources of nourishment, which are often animal products in the winter. And interesting side note, if you look at traditional like indigenous cultures that live in different areas of the world, such as the Inuit, um, they lived in cold areas and their diet, I'm pretty sure it was only animal products and it did involve a lot of animal fat from seal blubber. Whereas if you look at indigenous cultures that lived in warmer areas of the world, these were the cultures that ate tons of vegetables and fruit and may have even been vegetarian successfully because different living in different areas of the world actually does affect the type of food that our bodies need. Let's talk about snacks. So I've been eating a lot of snacks lately because three meals are just not enough for me or frankly if I'm honest sometimes lunch actually can fall by the wayside for me just because I do get busy as much as I don't want to be skipping meals so oftentimes it will be like two o'clock in the afternoon three o'clock in the afternoon and then I realize oh no I didn't have lunch and then I have what feels like a snack but really it's kind of like making up for the fact that I didn't eat lunch so that's not really the best but anyway <laughs> I am eating a lot of snacks even after dinner I find I need to have a snack before I go to bed or I get very starving by the time I actually lay down in bed and then I have to get up again and make myself food before I can sleep so yeah I'm eating a lot of snacks so some of my main go-to's lately have been high fat unsweetened yogurt and when I say high fat I really mean it I've been buying a type of yogurt that is literally I think it's 9 or 11 percent milk fat and this is because it's made with actual milk and cream and I love that and I've been eating it with raw honey on the side I love raw honey as well I also love old cheddar. I have a brand of old cheddar that is aged for two years, which means that here in Ontario, Canada, it is legally able to be sold even though it's made with unpasteurized milk because here, unfortunately, it's not legal to sell. Yeah, it's not legal to sell raw milk. So I personally love the idea of raw milk. I don't think I've ever even had it in my life though. So I really need to try to source some somehow, but Anyway, I can get some of the benefits through the raw cheese. I'm also loving goat cheese as well as fresh mozzarella. I really love cheese as a snack because it has fat and it has protein. Honestly, I didn't even eat a lot of dairy before getting pregnant, but in this pregnancy, for some reason, I just really right at the beginning started craving cheese. So I'm always, I always have cheese in the house now because it's great in a pinch for snacks as well. If I'm starving and in a pinch, I will toast a couple pieces of this German rye sourdough bread and put lots of butter on top and then some type of cheese, whatever I happen to be craving, and that's always a great snack and it fills me up. I'm also loving medjool dates. They are just so good to me in this pregnancy. I always have a tub of them and I eat tons and tons. Like I eat several of these every day. <laughs> Actually, I don't think I've fully mention this, but I am placing a huge emphasis on getting enough fats in my diet, especially saturated fats like butter and other animal fats, as well as coconut oil. And so well, my latest discovery is that it actually tastes delicious to take a big juicy medjool date, remove the pit, and then put some soft butter like inside of it and eat it. That's been <laughs> one of my favorite snacks lately. And it's very satisfying because it has the natural sugars in it that actually are great for feeding your liver and giving your body fuel but then it also has the fat from the butter so it sort of balances out any blood sugar spiking effects that could happen from the zate and it gives you that long-lasting energy source. After dinner is when I have more fun with my snacks because my kids are in bed and I usually try to be done with any sort of work stuff after dinner so that's when I might bake myself something. My favorite go-to comfort food to bake for myself has been vanilla souffle. I love souffle. I began having a love affair with it, well, many years ago really, but especially after my last baby was born in the postpartum, it became my go-to snack that I would make for myself when I needed comfort food, and it is very nourishing. It's made with four eggs, so whipped egg whites and then the egg yolks as well, and some milk and a little butter and flour and a bit of sugar, and it's just delicious and comforting and 
filling and just oh, so good to me. So I often make that for myself in the evenings. And not gonna lie, if no one else is around, I will eat the whole thing myself. So yeah, I'm eating a lot right now. <laughs> I've also been loving making myself vanilla custard as a snack in the evenings. So I make this with whole milk, cream, egg yolks, four egg yolks, some raw honey, which of course it's no longer raw once it's cooked into the custard, but it begins out as raw honey, and then a little, a little cornstarch. And I'm absolutely loving the vanilla custard. It's another one of those very satiating, very comforting foods. It does contain a lot of fat obviously from the cream and then it has the four egg yolks in there. I honestly consider this like a superfood for myself to be eating right now. And then if I have egg whites left over from making my vanilla custard, I'll often make myself something with the whipped egg whites. Like I've been loving making Italian meringue lately. It is quite sweet, so I don't make it that frequently, but it is delicious and it's obviously very high in protein. Okay, so let's talk about bone broth now. I have known about the benefits of bone broth for some time, but I've sort of had on and off phases with it. I was very into bone broth several years ago when I was on a very sort of strict gut healing protocol known as the GAPS diet. And so I had a lot of bone broth at that time, but I didn't do so well with the GAPS diet over the long term. After going off of that, I think I sort of like did a bit of a pendulum effect where I wasn't having as much bone broth anymore. And it's only been in this pregnancy that I've really gotten back into trying to have bone broth every single day because bone broth is full of minerals, full of great stuff like collagen, gelatin, and it's just really, really good for your body, especially when you're pregnant. You need a lot of extra minerals when you're pregnant and the collagen from bone broth is also amazing for skin health and hair health. I've actually recently gotten a book that is absolutely amazing for the postpartum. It's called The First 40 Days, and it's sort of a recipe book, but it's much more than that. It talks about the whole practice of having a restful and nourishing postpartum and the importance of that. But anyways, I've been looking at a lot of the recipes and I'm planning on making them soon here. And I'm really excited to make a bunch of different types of bone broth for myself and have them already in the freezer so my husband can just warm some up for me when I'm resting after this baby is born. Fat. Okay, let's talk about fat. I've already touched on this, but basically I like to have a ton of fat in my diet really at all times, but especially when I'm pregnant and postpartum. It is actually very vitally important to be getting enough saturated fat when you are either growing a baby or breastfeeding a baby. It's very important for the baby themselves, for their brain development, and for the growth of their body, but it's also important for the mother as well. I totally believe it's a big modern cultural myth that eating healthy saturated fats will make you get fat. I don't believe that. I actually believe it can often be the opposite, that if you're not getting enough fat, you're more likely to put on weight than if you are getting a lot of fat. That's certainly been my experience. Um, after my last baby was born, actually during his pregnancy even, I did mention that I wasn't really getting enough food and calories or prioritizing eating enough. But one thing I was doing right was I was getting a lot of fat through coconut oil. I would take two to three big spoonfuls of coconut oil every day and I noticed a big difference in how I felt. I sometimes get growing pains when I'm pregnant and I usually take this as a sign that my body is in need of some more minerals or some fat soluble vitamins. Taking a big spoonful of coconut oil would always cure this for me. It would also prevent leg muscle cramps and things like that. And especially during the postpartum when our body has gone through this massive undertaking of birth and we've lost a lot of fluids and we're just going through this big transition time, I found that having a lot of fat in my diet really helped to keep me stabilized emotionally as well. So yeah, I love fats. <laughs> uh, let's talk about carbs quickly. Carbs have been sort of a complex issue for me. I have never been low carb per se or on a keto diet per se, but like I mentioned briefly before, I was on the GAPS diet and although the GAPS diet is not technically a low carb diet, it does involve cutting out all grains, all starch containing foods, and in the early stages cutting out a whole bunch of other things. So it sort of inadvertently ended up being low carb and the carbs I were getting were not really the most sustainable way to be getting carbs. Anyway, I had a lot of issues on the GAPS diet. I actually lost a lot of hair. That was shortly before I cut my hair to chin length. And so now I always make sure to get fats. I love potatoes. I always have loved potatoes. They're like my love affair kind of go-to food. I make potatoes in all sorts of different ways. And yeah, but when it comes to grains, they are sort of a complex issue. 
So as I learned from the book Nourishing Traditions, which I read several years ago now, I do believe the best way to consume grains is through what we call the three S's. So either soaking, souring, or sprouting. Realistically, this is not always the way that I consume grains though. And when I do eat bread, I am pretty picky about the bread that I usually eat. So I like my German rye sourdough bread, which is a full sourdough bread. It's not made with any yeast. And I also will buy other types of sourdough bread, like this delicious sourdough baguette that again is not made with any yeast. And I did used to make my own sourdough bread, but I have just been feeling too busy to make room in my life for that lately. So I have been buying sourdough bread. And actually when I eat rice, I... I don't eat rice a whole off a whole lot, but I actually eat white rice, which is sort of not the conventional wisdom. But brown rice contains a lot more phytic acid, and the extra nutrients that are in brown rice are not necessarily absorbable absorbable by our bodies anyways. I actually eat white rice rather than brown rice. Okay, I'd like to give a quick mention to fermented foods because they are sort of a big part of my life and have been for a long time, especially since I read the book Nourishing Traditions. So I eat a lot of raw fermented sauerkraut. I also love kimchi, especially in the first trimester. I adored kimchi, especially the really spicy, pungent kimchis. If you don't know, kimchi is basically like curry and sauerkraut and it's a bit spicy and it's very delicious. I also adore kombucha kefir. I haven't been having a whole lot of kefir lately, but anyway, I have actually made all of these foods myself in the past, but again, for the past few years, I've just been feeling too busy, so I've been buying high-quality store-bought versions of all of these foods, and I absolutely love them. They are a great digestive aid. They're a great source of probiotics and enzymes, and they help build up your gut probiotic lining, which helps you, in addition to helping you digest your food, also helps you access more of the nutrients out of your food. Okay, so let's talk about supplements. So first I'll talk about the reason why I actually don't take a prenatal vitamin supplement and I haven't for any of my pregnancies except for the very first. This is probably sort of a controversial topic for most people because most people are taught that, you know, a prenatal vitamin is essential to have a healthy baby and healthy body and blah 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 blah. But anyways, I'm going to talk about why I don't take one and what I do instead. So in my very first pregnancy, I did take a high quality prenatal vitamin because that was just what you do, right? Like that's the best thing to do. And coincidentally, my only experience with that vitamin was with it increasing, increasing my nausea through the iron that was in them and otherwise not really noticing any positive effects from taking them. But I took it because again, that was what I believed you had to do. And I also didn't really have a big focus at all on a healthy diet at that time. So it probably was good for me to be taking it anyways. So after some time and a lot of research, I went down a whole rabbit trail of researching vitamins and minerals and the difference between natural food sourced vitamins and minerals versus man-made synthetic made in a lab vitamins and minerals. For example, if you buy a standard vitamin B complex vitamin supplement, B vitamins when they're synthetic are actually manufactured from petrochemicals. A lot of people don't know that. There's also a lot of reasons why taking synthetic vitamins, although I'm not completely against it, certainly not, can often kind of do the opposite of what we want it to do. A great example of this is folic acid. So folic acid is one of the big vitamins or nutrients or whatever it is that we're told that we need to have when we're pregnant because it prevents neural tube defects. This is actually not true. The real thing that we need is folate. Folate is the real food source version of folic acid. Folic acid is the man-made synthetic version. And the bad thing about folic acid is that, as I understand it, folic acid does not deliver the same benefits to the body as folate because it's not recognized by the body. But what it does do is it blocks your body's receptors for the real folate that we get through our diet, which essentially means that when you're taking synthetic folic acid, you're actually getting less real folate absorbed by your body than you would if you were not taking any folic acid. So that is just <laughs> really shocking. And there's also a lot of trickery in the vitamin industry, even with the high quality so-called food-based vitamin supplements, where they will say on the back, you know, the whole list of what it contains, and then they'll say folate. So at first glance, you think, great, it has the real folate, but then in brackets underneath, often it will say as folic acid. 
So basically they're lying. They're saying it's folate, but then they just put in brackets, by the way, it's actually folic acid. And that's not the one we want. That's the synthetic version that clogs up your body's receptors and doesn't have the same beneficial effects as real folate. And there's a lot of examples Generally, I would just say that vitamin supplements haven't been around for very long in history. They're relatively new. They're sort of a money grab. They are linked very strongly to the pharmaceutical industry and whatever you think of the pharmaceutical industry, it is an industry. It's for making money. People didn't take vitamin supplements for virtually all of human history until the past, I don't know how long they've been around. Um, but not very long in the grand scope of things. Anyways, after I discovered all of this, I decided that I wanted to replace all of the main nutrients that I would have been taking a prenatal vitamin for. I wanted to replace those with real foods or superfood supplements that I could incorporate into my diet. So for example, eggs, specifically egg yolks, are very high in B vitamins, in folate, in zinc, in iron, vitamin D, I believe vitamin K, and I believe biotin as well. So that's one of the reasons why I eat so many eggs in my life. I also incorporate liver into my diet for most of my pregnancy, and this has been in the form of organic grass-fed liver pills that I just swallow because unfortunately I never grew up eating liver, so the thought of it really grosses me out. But I wish I didn't because liver is a superfood, especially if it's organic liver. It is full of nutrients and really good for your body. I've actually heard it said that liver, eating liver every day can replace most of what is found in a multivitamin. Not everything, but most of it. For a rich source of vitamin B complex, I take two, two teaspoons of bee pollen every day, which has a whole host of other benefits, even outside of the realm of the nutrients that it contains, and I have been doing that for many years. I don't recommend just beginning to take bee pollen the full amount of two teaspoons. You really have to work up to it, and I have been working up to it for many years. But yeah, I love taking bee pollen. I also consume a few key plant-based superfoods every day in powder form that I just mix in with water and I drink every day. So these are maca, amla, and chlorella. I'm not going to go into the benefits of all of them because I'm getting out of breath and this video is long enough already, but yeah, those are the superfoods that I've been taking for quite a while now and I do notice a huge difference from taking them in terms of my energy levels. Obviously, the, chlor the chlorella is a great source of chlorophyll and all of those good things that are found in greens. The maca is an adaptogen. It helps my body adapt to stress. And the amla, or sometimes instead of amla, I'll take camu camu. Both of those are very high in vitamin C. I also consume a high quality mixture of fermented cod liver oil and butter oil. Sometimes I just take the cod liver oil, but then other times I'll buy the kind where it's already blended with the butter oil. Now this may sound kind of strange to you if you've never heard of it. I first heard about it from the book Nourishing Traditions, who hurt who indirectly got it from Weston A. Price, who is that dentist that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So he was around, I believe, in the 1920s and 30s, and he was really like, I've heard him described as the Isaac Newton of nutrition. He actually visited many indigenous cultures throughout the world and looked at the way that they ate and then the way that their health was, especially their teeth since he was a dentist. And basically what he found was that many of these indigenous cultures, so these were cultures that had not yet been contacted by the modern western world at all, they were still very isolated. And he found that many of these cultures, although they were in various different areas of the world, they had several things in common in what they ate and they all had amazing teeth health, like way better teeth than what Weston A. Price had seen in most of his Western clients, and they just had great overall health. They were basically consuming tons of food that were rich in fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, and K. They were also eating lots of organ meats. They were eating naturally fermented foods and fermented grains, and cod liver oil and butter oil specifically were one of the foods I believe that he saw some cultures eating, and certainly that West Denny Price discovered were high in all of these very key um, fat-soluble vitamins, and that they were cod liver oil and butter oil specifically were really great for teeth health, dental health, bone health, and even remineralizing cavities and things like that in his clients once he took these findings back home. Finally, I drink a herbal infusion on most days that I make myself, and I actually recently filmed a video all about this that I plan on releasing after the baby's born. It's a great tea to drink to nourish and remineralize your body, which is obviously great for hair health and skin health, which is why I'm going to be sharing it with all of you pretty soon. And also, just to wrap up, I'd like to say that I'm not anti-supplement 
Um, I know that everything I've just said so far might make it seem like I'm completely anti-supplement, but I'm not. I, I just, life experiences have definitely helped to balance me out and show me that there's like never say never. I have been taking a magnesium supplement throughout this pregnancy and I found that it's very helpful for me in reducing various pregnancy complaints as well as helping to decrease the um, massive amounts of prodromal labor that I tend to have with all of my pregnancies. The magnesium is basically like it helps your muscles to relax so it's great for that kind of thing. I also occasionally do take a vitamin D supplement and I do have a admittedly synthetic vitamin C supplement that I have on hand for sickness especially if someone in my family is sick and I want to prevent it to from spreading to everyone else. I'll give everyone a big dose of this vitamin C because it does really help. There's been times when I was the only one in my family who didn't get sick because I was the only one taking lots and lots of vitamin C. So yeah, I'm not totally anti-supplement by any means. And finally, back to the whole fermented foods and probiotics discussion, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that the state of our internal gut flora contributes greatly to how much nutrients we are able to absorb from the food we eat. So in other words, it doesn't matter how much healthy food you're eating, if your gut is not in a good state and it doesn't have a lot of good bacteria, you're not going to be absorbing as much of that healthy food as you would if you had better gut flora in place. So yeah, I do consume fermented foods pretty much every day, either sauerkraut or kombucha. Those have been my main go-tos lately, but I also love kimchi and kefir. And I do occasionally take a probiotic supplement as well. Okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about today. It's funny, it was going to be a shorter video, but once I sat down to actually write down notes of what I wanted to say, I realized, oh, I actually do have a lot to say about this topic. So thanks for watching through this with me and just listening to me talk about food and how I'm eating. It's obviously a very personal topic to everyone, how we eat. I'm not trying to tell anyone that they should be eating in any different way than how they already are. This is just me sharing my experiences. So if you found this video wildly helpful, be sure to give it a like, leave your comments below, and consider subscribing to my channel for more historical natural hair care content as well as handmade wardrobe content. Also if you'd like to send me a monetary thank you there is a super thanks button below the video where you can send me a super thanks or you can virtually buy me a coffee using the link in the description. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Okay everyone, see you on the next video!